السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. At least one person has to answer by the way. زاك زاك من الله خير. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد. So as we advertised today, we're talking about the trials of Imam Ahmad. Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahimahullah. The scholars said, and the historians, they said, مَوْقِفَانِ فِي الْإِسْلَامِ لَوْ لَا هُمَا لَنْحَرَفَ الْإِسْلَامِ They said there are two positions or two uh, like incidents in Islam. Had it not been for these two incidents, Islam would have changed. It wouldn't be the same religion that we would have today. And they said the first is the position of Abu Bakr Siddiq on the day of Ridda when a good number of the Arabian Peninsula apostatized and left Islam, but Abu Bakr remained firm and he insisted on fighting those who, ref who refused to fight zakah. Had it not been for this stance of Abu Bakr, we would have received Islam today that had no zakah in it. And the second is the position of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal during the mihna or the fitna of the creation of the Quran. Had he not stood firm, we would have received an Islam today where we believe that the Quran is not the speech of Allah, but it is the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's what we're going to look at. And obviously, with the time allotted, we're going to be brief. I believe uh, during the COVID year, I, we still have it on YouTube page. We did this in kind of uh, more detail, probably a four hour or something like that, like four one hour um, lectures or something. So Imam Ahmad was born in the year 164 after the Hijrah in the month of Rabi' al-Awwal. His name was Ahmad ibn Muhammad ibn Hanbal ibn Hilal ibn Asad ibn Idris ibn Abdullah. So Ahmad, the son of Muhammad, the son of Hanbal. But he's known as Ahmad, the son of Hanbal, even though Hanbal is his grandfather. But it's referred to as his last name because he was uh, a soldier and a popular individual. So he was known by the more famous of his fathers, by his grandfather, Hanbal. He was born, some narrations say he was born in Maru, but he more accurately was born in Baghdad, and he was an orphan. His childhood, his relationship with his mother, I, I must admit that يعني, after the Prophet and Abu Bakr and Umar, like I, there's not a biography that I love more than that, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal. It's really, really amazing. So he was born an orphan. He says, I never saw my father nor my grandfather. Never saw any of them. He was born an orphan, and he and his mother were extremely poor, very, very poor. A lot of stories about their poverty. But one of the things he would do, he would go to the marketplaces, and when people would load up their camels and their, uh, their animals with their merchandise, sacks of wheat or barley, what have you, there would be some holes in these, these bags, and some grains would fall on the ground. So he would, from his poverty, he would go down on the ground and just pick up grains of barley and wheat for hours and there'll be a small handful or maybe two handfuls after hours of collecting from the sand and they would wash it and they would boil it and they would eat that him and his mother it's very very poor and he had a great relationship with his mother he would obey her no matter what even under peer pressure one time the the river overflowed and his mother would be afraid for him when the river overflows she would tell him don't jump like everyone else jumps and he was, was with his friends and they all jumped and he refused. They said, come on, let's go. And he said, no, my mother doesn't allow me. Like as a young man, you know, you'd think peer pressure, whatever, they think I'm scared and you just do it. But he wouldn't do that. A man said, an eyewitness says, Kuntu ara Ahmad ibn Hanbal yuhyi layl wa huwa ghulam. So he said, I used to see Ahmad ibn Hanbal. He would pray the whole night in prayer. He would stand the night, not the whole night. He would stand in qiyam while he's ghulam, ghulam is a, a word you use for like a nine-year-old, 10-year-old, 11, like that. So he was since his childhood from the people of Qiyam. And there are many other incidents during his childhood that show his righteousness and the level of taqwa that he had as a child, the level of knowledge that he had. So one of the 
uh, one of the people commenting, he said, in one of the rich folks, he said, I bring my children, the teachers and the muaddibin, the muaddib is this person that you brought and they would teach your children, you know, they would teach them etiquette and manners and language and poetry. He says, I bring the muaddibin and I pay them a lot of money to teach my children and I don't see anything. And here's Ahmed ibn Hanbal, an orphan young boy and he's poor. But look at his adab, look at his knowledge, look at how much he knows and his manners. So he spent his youth like that. I'm, I'm just skipping some of these parts that will really get you to fall in love with the character. But his youth was spent in worship and spent in seeking knowledge. And he had great teachers, just some of the famous ones that we're going to mention. But he had many teachers and many of them were great and famous in their times, but of the less known names in our times. But of them was Abu Yusuf. This is a name that's familiar to us. Abu Yusuf was, was one of the, uh, or the student of Imam uh, Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, and he's the one who spread the Hanifi madhab. We have Abu Bakr ibn Ayyash, one of the great scholars, popular and known. Hushayim ibn Bashir, one of his teachers. Waqi' ibn al-Jarrah, which was the friend of Imam al-Shafi'i, and the famous lines of poetry, shakautu ila waqi'in su'a hifdi, that's the one. Uh, Imam al-Shafi'i himself was one of his teachers later on. And Abdul Razak al-Sana'ani. Abdul Razak al-Sana'ani was a scholar that became, that was so well known and so popular that if at the time, if you said Abdul Razak, nobody said which one. It was the Abdul Razak. Everybody knew Abdul Razak in Sana'a in Yemen. That's the Abdul Razak. Nobody said which Abdul Razak. Done. Just like in, in Houston, if you say Sheikh Salah, you won't say Sheikh Salah or Ali, Muhammad, خلاص, we know Sheikh Salah, right? Anyways, that's Abdul Razak al-Sana'ani, Sufyan ibn Uyayna, famous and known scholar, Sufyan ibn Uyayna, one of his teachers, Yahya ibn Sa'id al-Qattan, another popular name, and another who was very famous at the time, Ismail ibn Uliya, and there are others, but this is just a, a short list, including a man by the name of Yazid ibn Harun. Yazid ibn Harun was a major scholar at the time, and he was actually... One of the reasons why the Khalifa al-Ma'mun delayed the fitna. He didn't make it public out of fear of uh, Yahya ibn Harun or Yazid ibn Harun. He was afraid that if I say go right and Yazid ibn Harun goes left, the Ummah will follow this great scholar. That's the amount of influence that this Shaykh had. And he was such a great scholar, but he used to respect Imam Ahmad, even though that was his student. He used to respect him a lot. One of the things I like about Yazid ibn Harun, he used to joke a lot. He used to love joking. And Imam Ahmad, from his personality, he didn't like joking. He didn't like the Sheikh to be telling jokes or making people laugh. So out of respect for Imam Ahmad, Yazid ibn Harun would not tell jokes if Imam Ahmad was in the gathering. And one day, he couldn't see Imam Ahmad, so he thought he's not there. So he started joking. And Imam Ahmad <clears throat> did this. So when he saw him, he smacked his forehead and he told the other students, why didn't you tell me that Ahmed ibn Hanbal was here so that I wouldn't joke? That was Yazid ibn Harun. The fitna of the creation of the Quran started during the reign of the Khalifa al-Ma'mun. Then it continues with his brother al-Mu'tasim. Then it continues with al-Wathiq who really ended it, but it was al-Mutawakkil who came after who officially ended it. And uh, so we had Al-Ma'mun. So it started during the reign of Al-Ma'mun. Al-Ma'mun, he was uh, knowledgeable and he started to bring the books and the writings of the Persians and the Greeks and he was surrounded by such people and he was surrounded by a group that surfaced, surfaced later on and during that time known as Al-Mu'tazila. Al -Mu'tazila. And the Mu'tazila, they had certain issues with the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And historically, there are some names involved in that, but uh, there was uh, Al-Ja'd ibn Durhum, there was Al-Jahm ibn Safwan, and Bishr ibn Ghayyath, known as Bishr al-Marisi. And it's a combination of these teachings that eventually led to and formed what is known as this group as Al-Mu'tazila. And... Uh, 
and basically one of their issues is that they said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Bishr al-Marisi also said this specifically he said that Allah Azawajal does not speak doesn't talk طيب. the Quran is the speech of Allah no it's not according to him he said it's not the speech of Allah it's the creation Allah created the Quran but he did not speak طيب, what's your problem with Allah speaking they said that Allah is Qadim and يعني, Qadim means something that's ancient or has been there for a long time and speech is something that is renewable and they didn't see that it was appropriate for a being or for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is constant to have a quality that can be renewed. You speak, you, get, you, you bring new speech and then you stay quiet and then you speak. So they said this is not befitting. And so in order, trying to respect Allah, they went into something a lot more disrespectful and they said that the Qur'an is not the speech of Allah even though Allah in the Qur'an says it's a speech, the ahadith say it's a speech. This is what we believe about it, that it's the speech of Allah Azza wa Jal. But they're saying, no, Allah does not speak, so He created the Qur'an. So what would be the big deal if Allah created the Qur'an? There's some, a number of issues. Number one, anything that's created, so Allah is perfect and His creation is imperfect. So when you say the Qur'an is created, you're automatically implying that it is not perfect and that it will have mistakes and shortcomings and so on and so forth. And everything that is created has an end, and there are many other uh, issues. But the biggest problem really is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks, and now you're saying He does not have this attribute and He does not have this quality. And it just, historically, it got worse. Like they will say Allah has wisdom, uh, is al-hakim, He has hikmah, or, or he, ha he is the wise, but He doesn't have wisdom. He is the merciful, but he does not have mercy, which is, doesn't make any sense. And if I tell you this person is intelligent, but he doesn't have any intelligence, you would turn to me and say, why would you call him the intelligent one if he has no intelligence? So why is Allah the merciful if he has no mercy and the wise if he has no wisdom or without wisdom? Anyways, so what happened was, um, yeah, yeah, Harun al-Rashid, when he, so Harun al-Rashid, he is the father of al-Ma'mun, the Khalifa before. Harun al-Rashid was wise and he was uh, well-educated and understand, understood his religion. Harun al-Rashid, when he heard of Bishr al-Marisi talking about his nonsense and saying the Quran is not the speech of Allah, Allah doesn't speak, the Quran is created. He said, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unites me with him, and if I ever see Bishr al-Marisi, I'm going to have him executed. If I ever see Bishr al-Marisi, I'm going to execute him immediately. So Bishr al-Marisi went into hiding and never resurfaced until Harun al-Rashid died, rahimahullah. And only after that, and then al-Amin, which is the brother of al-Ma'mun, then when al-Ma'mun came, and Amin, his mother, he had an Arab mother, and al-Ma'mun did not have an Arab mother. What does that mean? It means he was with those people, meaning the non-Arabs, and he started, as we said, to accept the writings of the Persians and the Greeks, and they would translate these works, and he was with that crowd, and it's that crowd that had the Mu'tazila amongst them, and they're the ones who started to convince him of the views of the Mu'tazila. That the Quran is not created, it's, it's, uh, it's not the speech of Allah and it's created. So in the beginning, he was afraid to go public because of Yazid ibn Harun, as I told you. And he waited, and six years after the death of Yazid ibn Harun, only then did he publicly start going forward with this new belief. And they didn't go forward by having discussions or anything like that. They were going to force people upon their belief. You have to believe what we're saying, or you're going to be imprisoned, you're going to be executed, that's how they had discussions. There's a man, and this name is going to come up a lot, his name was Ahmad ibn Abi Duad. Ahmad ibn Abi Duad was one of the leaders of the Mu'tazila, and he found a way to be close to Al-Ma'mun. Al-Ma'mun trusted him, he became his advisor, his right-hand man, and to the point that Al-Ma'mun put it in his, in his will, and on his deathbed, insisted to his brother to make sure that he keeps Ahmad ibn Abi Duad as his minister or his right-hand man and he keep him close to him and to continue upon 
the belief concerning the Quran that it's the creation and not the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he's telling Al Mu'tazim even on his deathbed. So that's one name, Ahmad ibn Abi Du'ad. He's going to be there during the time of Al Ma'mun. And then Al Mu'tazim, Al Wathiq, he's going to be there the whole time. And then we have Ishaq ibn Ibrahim. Ishaq ibn Ibrahim was the chief of police in Baghdad. So he's the guy in charge of everything in Baghdad. And he is the one who would re like replace the Khalifa. Because at this point, the Khilafa, the capital of the Khilafa, was moved to Baghdad. And when the Khalifa would leave and go somewhere else for the summer, Ishaq ibn Ibrahim is the guy in charge in his place. And so the Khalifa now traveled in the summer. He would go camp out in another area. He wrote a letter to Ishaq ibn Ibrahim, chief of police of Baghdad. And he said to test all the judges of Baghdad concerning what they believe about the Quran. Is it the speech of Allah or is it created by Allah? So the scholars then, he, in the beginning he wrote set names of seven scholars. He said, test these seven people. And he didn't pick from the top tier level of scholars, just seven of the known scholars. He said, ask them. And they then started to question them. Ishaq ibn Ibrahim invited them all seven, one by one. And he started to ask them, and he said, um, he said, what do you believe about the Quran? Is it the speech of Allah or is it the creation of Allah? Some of them said, I, it's the speech of Allah. But if Amir al-Mu'mineen wants me to say it's the, the, the creation of Allah, I'll say it. So Ishaq ibn Ibrahim says, well, at the moment he didn't say that. He just is asking about what you believe. Um, and, and there were certain names, yani, there were of these scholars that shouldn't have. But then, so this is the first seven that he asked these questions. And they're saying, this is what we believe. Are we supposed to say otherwise? He says, not yet, you're not. I'm just testing you, just getting uh, some feedback here. Then he starts to, the second round of questioning, and they're questioning different scholars. What do you say about the Quran? One of them, was, his name was Abu Ma, uh, Abu. Uh, Ma'mar, um, uh, uh, basically he was one of, one of the contemporaries of Imam Ahmed. And when he came out, he agreed that the Quran was created. He came back, he said, Kafarna wa kharajna. Yani we went in, we disbelieved and we came out. So <laughs> he tells his servant, he says, uh, he says, bring the mule. فَإِنَّ مَوْلَاكَ قَدْ كَفَرْ He tells his servant, bring, bring the mule so we can get out of here. Indeed, your, your master became a kafir today. <laughs> Anyways, so Imam Ahmad, all the scholars that start to agree that the Qur'an is created, he's, Imam Ahmad gave a fatwa. You're not to narrate a hadith from them. You're not to write down any fatwa from them. And that the major scholars should not pray over them. Yahya ibn Ma'in, who used to be a very close friend of Imam Ahmad. And he came to visit him one time, and uh, Imam Ahmad was sick. This is later on. He came to visit him, and Imam turned his back to him. So he's on his bed, he turned around, and didn't say a single word to him, refused to speak to him. Never forgave them for saying or breaking and saying that the Qur'an is the creation of Allah. Another by the name of Al-Huzami, he came to visit Imam Ahmad. When he opened the door and saw it was him, he closed the door in his face, refused to talk to them. He was very upset with them. Because now we have the, the first group, they were saying, okay, the seven that they were asked, they were saying that if you want me to say it, I'll say it, it's not a problem. The second group also begins to agree. So they're being questioned by the chief of police and they're saying, okay, it's created. Or some would say, well, I believe it's the speech of Allah, but if you want me to say that uh, otherwise, I'll say it. So uh, there is one, for example, by the name of Abil Hassan Ziyadi. And he, uh, he asked him, he was asked, so what is the Quran? He said, Kalamullah, the speech of Allah. He says, and Allah created everything. So he's saying, the Qur'an is the speech of Allah. And Allah created everything. And anything besides Allah 
is created. Right? Anything wrong with what he's saying? The, Qur uh, the Quran is the speech of Allah, and Allah created everything, and everything that is not Allah is created. Make sense? So then he asked him again, and he read the letter of the Khalifa to him. Khalifa now is starting to be severe in his language against those who are going to be either on the fence or saying that the Quran is the speech of Allah. So he says, the scholar responded to him, he said, that's the opinion of Amir al-Mu'mineen. If he commands me to say it, I'm going to say it. So Ishaq ibn Ibrahim tells him he didn't say that yet. So then he calls Imam Ahmad. So you're saying what, you're seeing what he tried to do. He said, the Quran is the speech of Allah. But then he said, he left room. He said, everything besides Allah is created. So he's like hinting, like I'm kind of agreeing with you. But he's not explicitly saying it. Then it was Imam Ahmad's turn. And they said, what do you think of the Quran? He said, Kalamullah, the speech of Allah. So he asked him, is it created? He said, Kalamullah. I'm not going to tell you everything besides Allah. It's the speech of Allah. So, uh, so then he's, he said, ليس كمثله شيء وهو السميع البصير. There is nothing like him, like Allah, and he is the all hearing, all seeing. So someone at the audience said, uh, allow me to speak. And he got up and now he's trying to create problems. So he tells the chief of police, Ishaq ibn Ibrahim, he says, he is saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears with ears and speaks with a mouth. And that was never said by Imam Ahmad, nor any of the people of the Sunnah ever said that Allah speaks with a mouth and no one ever described Allah in such a way. You know, and, and there's a rule that we don't attribute to Allah that which he did not attribute to himself. You know, there was a trick question that goes, does Allah hear? You say yes. Well, doesn't anything that hears have an ear? Yes. So does Allah have ears? So the poor guy fell into it. He said yes. No, the rule is you don't affirm to Allah Azza wa Jal anything that he has not affirmed to himself. Khalas, done. So, um, so then basically, uh, what happened now? A large group of people agreed. A large group of scholars and judges in Baghdad agreed that the Quran is created and it's not the speech of Allah. A very small group of scholars said, no, the Quran is the speech of Allah uncreated. It is not the creation of Allah Azza wa Jal. Then a middle group, yani in size, not too big and not too small, they said, we'll go either way. If the Amir insists that we say the Quran is created, we'll say it. Right now we're saying it's the speech of Allah. Um, there's a, a scholar by the name of Ibn al-Bakka al-Akbar, just showing you how different people responded. They came to him and they said, is the Quran created? He said, the Quran is maj'ul. Maj'ul. Because Allah says, inna ja'alnahu Quranan arabiyya. We made it an Arabic Quran. So, <laughs> so then he asked him, he said, isn't everything that is maj'ul created? He said, yes. So you see, he's trying to kind of like find a way out, but not be very explicit. If everything is maj'ul, made, if everything is made, it's created. So I'm kind of saying indirectly that it's created. There were others who came and they were asked, what do you think of the Quran? What do you say about the Quran? He said the Quran, the Injil, the Torah, the Zabur, the Suhaf, all these are created. All these five are created. You understand? They mean all these fingers of mine are created. They're playing with words so they don't get in trouble. They're saying all these are created. So it sounds like I'm agreeing with you, but I'm saving myself. And Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, he saw, even though it's permissible for you to say things like this to save your life, but he saw that this was not appropriate because this is an issue of our belief in aqidah and there are thousands of people who hang on to your words and if all the scholars break down and say the Quran is created, then the weight is going to be on the shoulders of very few. Whereas if all the scholars stood firmly against it, it would be easier. So he thought it was inappropriate and not excusable for a scholar to say these vague statements just to, to free themselves and get themselves out of trouble. Anyways, then the, 
Ishaq ibn Ibrahim, he writes a letter detailed with the position of every scholar and judge, what they said when they were questioned. And then the Khalifa wrote back. Interestingly, the ones that were neutral, he insulted them and called them thieves. And I know that he embezzled and stole money. And this one is nothing but an in immature child. And once I whip him, he will understand the truth. And bad-mouthed all of them, except for Imam Ahmad. No insults, but he said, I will personally deal with him, just like a threat. So, he said then, those who say no, chain them up and send them to me. I'll deal with them personally. Those who said no, chain them up and bring them to me. There were nine scholars at this point who refused to say the Quran is the creation of Allah. And when they were told you're going to be chained and sent to the Khalifa and he's going to deal with you there, seven of them pulled out. So now we have just two left. Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahimahullah and a young man, a hero by the name of Muhammad ibn Nuh, a young student of knowledge and a student of Imam Ahmad. Not many people know his name. This young man, he died in this mihna in the creation of the Quran. He was of... Just him and Imam Ahmad are the only ones who remained firm. So they chained them up and they, and, and at this point, by the way, they started questioning all the scholars and judges of Baghdad and the rest of Iraq and Egypt and Hijaz, Mecca, Medina. And everyone who said no was put in prison. And the prison, instead of being filled with thieves and, and robbers, and they were just loaded and filled with scholars and judges and, and great people. But bit by bit, they start to agree and come out of jail. Until we said there were only nine left, and then when they heard they're going to be sent to the Khalifa directly, seven of them also said uh, the Quran is created and two only remain. Yes? Okay, so why is it wrong to say it's created? Or why is it wrong to say it's... Ah. Okay, so he's not punishing those who say it's created. He is letting, he is letting them go because that's his position. Al-Ma'moon was surrounded by the Mu'tazila who said Allah doesn't speak. If he doesn't speak, the Quran is not his speech. Therefore, the Quran is created. So if you say it's created, you're one of them. You're okay with them. They let you out of jail. So people start to break down and say the Qur'an is the creation of Allah. The right one is the Qur'an is the speech of Allah. And what's the big deal if you say, okay, so what if you say the Qur'an is created? See, it just opens up a can of worms. And it actually did. Because when they say, well, okay, Allah doesn't speak. He created the Qur'an. All right? Why? Because if Allah speaks, we speak, we're like Allah. So then they said, Allah doesn't hear. Why? Because we hear. So if we hear and Allah hears, we're like Allah. And Allah uh, doesn't do this, because if He does that and we do that, then we're like Him. But no, we're not. Who in their right mind would think, because we can hear, that means we hear like how Allah hears. No one in their right mind thinks that. Even in the animal kingdom, and nobody would think that because this animal can do this and that one can do it, they do it in the exact same manner. They do it in different ways, each being in a way that befits its being, in, or, or in the case of Allah, His greatness and His majesty. And then it's going to go into knowledge and all kinds of other things, as we're going to see in the story, but i got to move a bit faster, I guess, okay? So, naam, fadali. Yeah, so... <laughs> That's exactly right. They can be, and you're a step ahead of us. That's exactly what's going to be happening in these debates. Good job. So, uh, he says, tie them up, send them to me, and I'm going to treat them with the sword, every single one of them. So, now what happens? We have... Uh, and of course, and not everyone يعني, backed out. Some people like Naim ibn Hamad uh, or Nuaim ibn Hamad. He is uh, an individual, a scholar who wrote 13 books responding to the bid'ah and the, the, uh, the shubahat uh, of the Mu'tazila. And he's 
Bukhari narrates from Nu'im ibn Muhammad, and Nasa'i narrates from him, and Tirmidhi narrates from him. He was a great scholar, but he died in his chains in Samarra in Iraq. So Allah, so some were brave and they died in their chains. They died in jail before they came out. So Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal and Muhammad ibn Nuh, these are the only two remaining. And now they're on their way. It's just them and the soldiers with their weapons and everything. And these two men are on their chains, in their chains, and they're going to meet the Khalifa. On the way, a man from, they, they stopped in an area called Ruqqa, and a man from Rabi'ah comes. And, and Saleh, who is the son of Imam Ahmad and also a narrator of hadith, he, he narrates a story from his father. He said that this man came to him. He said, I didn't even know the man. Okay, but later on they come to know that his name is Jabir ibn Amir. And he comes to Imam Ahmad and he speaks to him so beautifully. Actually, uh, I have the exact, uh, I left it. But he tells him that do not respond to what they're calling you to. And he tells him between you and Al-Jannah is that you're killed. And what would it harm you if you were killed here today and you enter Al-Jannah here today? And he tells him, if you were killed, you die a martyr in Mitta, Mitta Shahidan. And if you live, you live a hero. And if you make it past this and you live, you will be a hero. You stood firm and people will idolize you and they'll always know what you did for Islam. And if you die today, you'll die a martyr and you'll enter Al-Jannah today. So he's telling him, be firm. And Imam Ahmad said, from what he said to me was what kept me strong during this entire thing. So the last stop before they meet the Khalifa, he says, a servant of Al-Ma'moon comes into me and he's in tears. And he says, it is wallahi your soul. The Khalifa has unsheathed a sword that he has not unsheathed in a long time. And he has sworn by his blood relations to the Prophet ﷺ. This is the Abbasid dynasty. And no, it's not permissible to swear by anything besides Allah. Okay. But he said he has sworn by his relationship to the Prophet ﷺ that he's going to kill you with that sword. So Imam Ahmad, when that happened, he prayed and finished the prayer. He put his hands up and he made dua to Allah. And he says, Ya Allah, your patience with this man has deluded him to the point that he thinks he can do whatever he wants. He says, Ya Allah, if the Quran is your speech uncreated, then basically save us from this man. He finished from the dua, he put his hands down, he heard commotion, yelling, people making noises left and right. What happened? They tell him the Khalifa just died. So the Khalifa just died. And now they don't know what to do with Imam Ahmad. Like, what are we gonna do with you? So they turn back to Baghdad. So now it's him and Muhammad ibn Nuh by themselves going on the road with all the whip, the floggers and all the, the soldiers with their weapons. And they're just being with their chains walking all the way back. And on the way, Muhammad ibn Nuh, this young man, he, got, he falls ill. And before he dies, he starts to uh, give advice to Imam Ahmad, telling him that I'm a nobody, but you, you are known and people look to you and people quote you. So be firm and do not agree to what they're calling you to. And then he dies. And when he dies, Imam Ahmad washes him, shrouds him and prays over him and they buried him. And he is buried just somewhere on the road to Baghdad. Nobody knows where his grave is. And young man, but he gave up his life for this, even though many people don't know what he did and what kind of a hero he was. So then he says, um, yeah, yeah. So uh, the, yeah, yeah. And so Imam, uh, Imam Ahmed now is put in his prison and because they want to know until the next Khalifa takes over, what's going to happen to him. So they leave him in prison. And his grandson, Muhammad, he narrates, I would visit him with my father, Saleh. This is Saleh, the, the son of Imam Ahmed. So I would visit him with my father and a group of other people. And we actually read a book and he explained it to us during that period while he was in prison. He was explaining and teaching us. And then we asked him, you lead the prayer in your chains? Look, he's chained up and he's leading the salah and he's got all these other people. They follow him in the salah and he tells them yes. And then he gives them the, the evidence that the companions were 
jailed after this battle and they were praying in their chains. So even though he's in jail, he's still teaching and explaining books. And one time, and you can imagine these prisons and how hot it is in Baghdad, and there's no fan, no AC. So he says one time the prison guard brought him a bowl of water and it had the ice in it. You can understand how rare ice was. Like they would bring it from mountaintops and bring it quickly. In the, you can't preserve it in a freezer or anything. So he brought him ice cold water and the imam was dying of thirst. So he grabbed it and he looked at it. Then he asked the guard, he said, do you have enough ice for everyone in the prison? And he said, no. He said, then how can I drink water with ice and everyone else drinks regular water? And he gave it back. And these are just the subtle things that just make you love this man, rahimahullah. Like just out of just like, oh yeah, next time you get ice, you get me more ice also. Huh? You remember me, put some on the side. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Uh, so, uh, so his uncle is Haq ibn Hanbal. His uncle comes to him, and, he, and, he, and his uncle is one of those who agreed. They don't believe, he didn't believe the Quran was created, but he, just for the sake of, you know, just getting out of this problem, he agreed. So he tells him, and he, it's permissible for you in Islam to say something to save your life. I mean, why do you have to put yourself in this position? So he tells Imam Ahmad, responds to him, what would you do with the hadith of Khabbab ibn al-Arat? Khabbab, the companion, radiallahu anhu. And this is a man that was tortured so severely that decades later, during the Khilafah of Umar, he takes off his shirt, he shows the scars on his back, and Umar ibn Khattab can't believe it. He says, ma ra'aytuka al-yawmi ajaba. He said, what is this? He's never seen injuries like this. These are the punishments that Khabbab radiallahu anhu went through. And Khabbab radiallahu anhu went to the Prophet and he didn't even complain. He didn't complain. He said to the Prophet, he said, Ala tad'u lana? Ala tastansir lana? Will you not make dua for us? Will you not make dua for victory for us? That's all he said. And the Prophet sat up. And then he says, so this is the part that Imam Ahmad quotes to his uncle Ishaq. He says, Inna man kana qablakum kana yunsharu ahaduhum bil munshar. From the people before you, from the believers before you, one of them would be cut in half with a saw. And that would not get him to leave his religion. He said, he said what do I do with this hadith? His uncle is telling him, just say anything and get out of it. He's saying, what do I do with this hadith? People used to be cut in half and they would remain firm and not leave their deen. And you want me just because of prison to quickly just back down? He used to say, Imam Ahmad used to say, I don't fear imprisonment. It's the same as my home. You're in a room in prison. At home, you're in a room. Okay. He said, I don't fear the sword. I'm not afraid of death. He said, what I'm really afraid of is the whip. I'm really afraid of the whip. And he's, he was physically a, a very thin and very weak man physically. And he's human and he's afraid of the whip. And he's afraid that the whip will be too difficult for him to withstand. And he might break down and say what they want to say. He says, then a criminal in the prison who was arrested for some other crime, heard him, and he tells him, don't worry about it. Look, it's just the first two that hurt, and then you don't feel the rest. I've had it a lot of <laughs> and it's And it's beautiful, it's amazing how scholars would tell him, say it, Allah has given you an excuse, you don't have to withstand this. And the criminal is the one who makes him brave. He said, look, only the first two hate, hurt, don't worry about the rest. And he said, when he said that to me, it made me feel comfortable. Okay, he tells him, you don't know where the rest fall. You won't feel it. He said, when he, this guy said that to me, it made me courageous and made me feel comfortable. So the next Khalifa is Al-Mu'tasim. Al-Mu'tasim is a soldier. He was not studious. He was not even well spoken. Many times in his the Khalifa, he would be speaking and he would make mistakes, grammatical mistakes. And it was embarrassing and it looked really bad. The story behind his ignorance when he was a young boy, remember his father is Harun al-Rashid. And now he's got his brothers al-Ma'moon, and he's got al-Wathiq, right? But he was the only ignorant one amongst them. When he was young, he used to hate school. And one day, one of his, uh, what do you call a co-student? What is it called? Uh, 
Zumala, yani. Classmate, thank you very much. One day one of his classmates died. So when he told the news to his father, he said, so and so died. Allah rid him of school. <laughs> and he's like, alhamdulillah, he doesn't have to deal with school. He died at least, doesn't have to deal with school. So Harun al-Rashid said, you hate school that much? So he took him out of school. Later on as a grown man and as a Khalifa, making mistakes and not being very bright up here, he regretted. He didn't look back and say, my father, rahimahullah, may Allah reward him, took me out of school. He would, he would say, the love of Harun destroyed us. Yani Harun's love and spoiling me and taking me out of school because out of love, it was damaging to me. I wish he kept me in school so I could you know, learn and be presentable. And at least when I speak, I'm eloquent. So he regretted it. I'm just repeating this story. He's for the youth in the audience like, who hate school and wish they could just leave school. When you grow up, you'll regret not going to school. You won't be like, oh, it's great. I had a great childhood. Like, no, I wish I went to school. All right. Anyways. Um, so the Al-Mu'tasim now, Imam Ahmad, he is, th this was in, the, in Ramadan, 17th of Ramadan. He's still been in prison this whole time. Ishaq ibn Ibrahim, uh, he said Ishaq ibn Ibrahim would send me two men every day to debate with me. I was wearing one chain. I had the chain from my arms to my legs. Two men would come and debate with me. And every time the debate is over, they would order another chain. So the first day, they asked for another chain. He has two now. Then the third day, they would order a third chain. These chains are huge. They're heavy. And so he said, by the end of the third day, I had four chains on me. They're heavy and he's weak. And uh, these two men, while they were debating me, he goes into the debate. He says, I asked them, uh, so you're saying Allah's speech, Allah does not speak, but uh, he created the Quran. Because type, then he says, okay, what about Allah's knowledge? Are you going to tell me that's created? What's, what's the link here? So when you start to say that the attributes of Allah are created, now we can apply that to all the other attributes. Allah doesn't speak, so he had to create the Qur'an as, instead of speaking. So now every attribute, you're going to say it's created. So he got them here, he goes, Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, he said, okay, what about the knowledge of Allah? Azawajal? Was that created? And one of them said, yes. The two men that debate him said, yes. So Imam Ahmad tells him, kafart, you become a disbeliever. So the guard, he doesn't understand this stuff. It's too deep for him. It's over his head. The guard gets angry with Imam Ahmad. He said, this is the messenger of Amir al mumin How could you say that to him? So Imam Ahmad dumbs it down for the guard. He says, this man is saying that Allah's knowledge is created. That means before he created his knowledge, he had no knowledge. And how could he create his knowledge when he didn't have any knowledge? How did he have the knowledge to create knowledge when he didn't have any knowledge? He said the guard then started giving this guy a dirty look. He was just, just standing there looking at him like, how could you? And even the simple guard saw what was wrong with all the stuff that they were saying. So, uh, so then Imam Ahmad tells him, whoever says the Quran is created is a kafir. And whoever says the knowledge of Allah is created is a kafir. And whoever says the names of Allah are created is a kafir. So now, uh, now Imam Ahmad, uh, a message is sent to him from Ishaq ibn Ibrahim, the chief of police. He says, Wallahi Ahmad, it's your soul. Yani you're going to die. And the Khalifa has sworn to not kill you with the sword. And he's going to whip you and throw you in a place where there is no sun. And he will continue to beat you until you die. So then he... Now he's going to send him to the new Khalifa. So he said, let me try one more time. Chief of police says, let me give it a shot. He says, yeah, Akhi, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna ja'alnahu Qur'anan Arabiya. We made it an Arabic Qur'an. Isn't everything that is made created? So Imam Ahmad, this is the first time hearing this argument, immediately responds to him. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Fil, فَجَعَلَهُمْ كَعَصْفٍ مَأْكُولٍ And he made them, it's like, like a crop that has been trampled and eaten, just that visual. 
So he said, did Allah create them to look like that? Or he made, يعني, what does جعلهم here mean? Did Allah create them all over again? So when Allah says, جعلناه قرآنا عربيا, we made it an Arabic Quran, means we created it. And when Allah made them look like this destroyed, you know, corn stalks, this cornfield, did he make, create them all over again? So Ishaq ibn Ibrahim saw that he had no chance. He gave up and he sent him to the Khalifa. And uh, he says, they, they took me to the Khalifa and I had all these chains on me and I almost fell on my face trying to get out of the boat that took us across the river. And they put me in a small room in a house and it was completely dark. They didn't give me any light, it was pitch black. So I started to touch around on the ground until I found a large bowl filled with water and I made wudu and I prayed. So he spent the night in prayer. In the morning I was taken to the Khalifa and we're going to look at it through uh, the narration, the eyewitness account of a man by the name of Sulaiman al-Sajzi. He says there was a crowd outside the palace of the Khalifa like it was Eid. And I basically, he says, I found my way in and I found a mat that was placed in front of a chair. And while I was standing there, Al-Mu'tasim, the Khalifa, walked in and he sat down and he took both his shoes off and then he put one foot or one leg on top of the other, crossed his legs and then he said, Ya Ahmad, they had brought Imam Ahmad already, speak and don't be afraid. So Imam Ahmad tells him, Wallahi, I have entered upon you and there is not a small ounce of fear in my heart. So he tells him, come close. Imam Ahmad got close, come closer, got close. He says, sit down. Imam Ahmad said, I sat down and my chains were so heavy. And I was like relieved to sit down. So he tells him, what do you call to? He asked Imam Ahmad. Imam Ahmad said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad Rasulullah, the shahada. So the Khalifa says, and I witnessed that as well. Or the Khalifa says that, and Imam Ahmad says, I also witnessed that, that la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Then Imam Ahmad starts to tell him a hadith. And the hadith, it's a narration from Ibn Abbas. And it was a smart choice because Ibn Abbas, this is the Abbasid dynasty. So this is like their ancestors of Ibn Abbas. And it's a big deal to them. So he tells them this hadith going back to Ibn Abbas in which uh, the, when the Prophet ﷺ was approached by the delegation of Qais, and the Prophet ﷺ tells them the pillars of Islam and he tells them this is it, this is Islam, this is Iman. So the Khalifa is quiet. Then he says, had I not found you in the hands of the Khalifa before me, I wouldn't have spoken to you, I would have left you alone. Then uh, Abdullah ibn Ishaq, this is another person, Abdullah ibn Ishaq, he, so the Khalifa turns to Abdullah ibn Ishaq, he says, didn't I tell you to stop with his whole creation of the Quran thing? And Imam Ahmad thought to himself, says, Allahu Akbar, this is going to be an ease for the believers. And if this fitna is finished, then he turned to Ishaq ibn, uh, uh, um, yeah, then he turned to Imam Ahmad and he said, what do you say about the Quran? He said, Kalamullah, the speech of Allah. And then he says, okay, do you have any proof for that? He said, yes. The verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِنْ أَحَدٌ مِّنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ اسْتَجَارَكَ فَأَجِرْهُ يعني حتى, The verse ends with, حَتَّى يَسْمَعَ كَلَامَ اللَّهِ Until he hears the speech of Allah. The Quran, here the verse is saying, if any of the disbelievers ask for your protection, then give him your protection and escort him all the way to their place of safety or their home until he can hear the speech of Allah. So he said, the Quran is the speech of Allah. It's clear from the Quran. He says, do you have anything else? He said, Allah Azawajal says, Ar-Rahman allam al-Quran. Allah taught the Quran. He didn't say Allah created the Quran. He said, do you have anything else? He said, Allah says, Yaseen wal-Quran al-Hakim. And he didn't say wal-Quran al-Makhluq, the created Quran. He's trying to tell him, there's never a verse that described the Quran that it was created. And we have verses mentioning that it's the speech of Allah. So the Khalifa was shaken and, and then he broke up the gathering. And then next day, day two, they gathered everyone again and he came and he sat down and he says, Ya Ahmad, how were, how were you in your prison cell last night? 
Imam Ahmad said, I was good except something strange happened. He said, what happened? He said, I made wudu and I prayed Al-Fatiha and then Surah Al-Nas. Then the second rak'ah Al-Fatiha and then Surah Al-Falaq. And then I recited Al-Fatiha and I wanted to recite, uh, I said Al-Nas, but the first one was Al-Ikhlas. I said, I wanted to recite Surah Al-Nas again, but I couldn't. So I tried to recite from anywhere in the Quran. I couldn't. And then when I looked over in the corner, I found the Quran. It had died. So I took it, I washed it, I shrouded it, I prayed over it, and I buried it. So the Khalifa, remember, he's not a very bright guy. He says, Wayhak, does the Quran die? He said, That's what you say. You said it's created, and everything that's created dies or has an end. The Quran died last night. So the Khalifa, being a dim-witted, he goes, Qaharana Ahmad. Qaharana Ahmad, Ahmad destroyed us. Yani with all the other intelligent arguments, only this one destroyed you. He said, Ahmad destroyed us. So then he goes, debate him. He's talking to all the scholars of the Mu'tazila sitting there. Debate him, talk to him. Fadda. So, so he says, Ahmed destroyed us. He says, now he yells at the scholars around him, the Mu'tazili scholar. Debate with him, talk to him. And uh, he would say, Ya Ahmed ibn Ishaq, talk to him, debate him. So Ahmed ibn Ishaq got up and he said, what do you say of the Quran? He wants to start over. He said, what do you say of the Quran? Imam Ahmed said, what do you say of the knowledge of Allah? He sat down quickly. He saw that it was a trap. Because if he said the knowledge of Allah is created, he, <laughs> I mean, we have a problem. You're now saying there's a time when Allah didn't have knowledge and how did he create his knowledge or who created his knowledge. You go into a whole deep well of kufr here. So if you're denying the attribute of Allah of knowledge, then in the same way you can deny the attribute of or if you deny the speech, you can deny the knowledge. So the minute he saw the trap, he sat down. He said, then a second one got up. He asked me a question. I responded to him, he sat down. A third guy got up, asked me a question, I answer him, he sits down. Fourth guy sits down. And every time he said, I would turn to the Khalifa and I would say, give me something from the book of Allah or the sunnah of his messenger so that I may say it. Don't give me this nonsense. Give me something from the Quran, I'll say the same as you say. Give me a hadith, I'll say the same. Another person would get up, he would knock them down and he would turn to the Khalifa. Give me something from the book of Allah or the sunnah of his messenger. And I'll say it. So Ahmad ibn Abi Du'ad says, and you only speak from what is in the Quran and what is from the sunnah. He is astray and he is leading people astray. 
Ya Amir al-Mu'minin, you have the judges here. Ask them and see what they think. So the Khalifa asked the judges and they all said, he is misleading and he is misled and he will lead people astray. He said, then we start arguing again and my voice would go louder than their voice. They're debating in front of the Khalifa. And then one of them jumps up. He says, what about the hadith of Khattab? You will never get close to Allah with something that is dearer to him. Ahabbu ilayh min kalamih. The Mu'tazila guy said this. Imam Ahmed said, I just looked back at him and I said, Kalamuh. Yani the guy, <laughs> in the heat of the argument, wants to give a hadith. He gives a hadith saying this is a speech of Allah. So he tells him, yeah, his speech. He just repeated that last part. And the man sat down and Ahmed ibn Abi Du'ad just started looking at him. Angry. Could you? So, <laughs> um, then... Ahmad ibn Abi Du'ad said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created everything. Agreed? The Quran is a thing, yes or no? Khalas, we're done. Now how would you respond to that? Allah created everything. Is the Quran a thing or not? It is. Khalas, we're done. So, then remember these arguments, Imam Ahmad is hearing them for the first time. He doesn't like, he didn't like prepare for them or anything. So the man says, well, Allah created everything. Is the Quran a thing? We're done. So Imam Ahmad tells him, the wind that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent, he described in the Quran, تُدَمِّرُ كُلَّ شيء. It destroys everything. So he said, did it destroy everything? He said, yes, destroyed everything. He said, okay, then how is it in the next verse immediately, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَأَصْبَحُوا لَا يُرَى إِلَّا مَسَاكِنُهُمْ How is it? The next verse Allah says, in the morning, nothing could be found or seen except for their homes. The verse right before it said it will destroy everything. Next verse says their homes were left. So how? So the man stayed quiet. So Imam Ahmad explains to him, he says, Ya Rajul, it destroyed everything that could be destroyed. But their homes were built of stone, carved into the mountains, could not be destroyed. In the same way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created everything, everything that could be destroyed. But the speech of Allah, the Qur'an, is the speech of Allah. Yani it's from the attributes of Allah, cannot be created. So he sat down. The Dhuhr time came, the Khalifa says, Qumu, everyone get up. So, except Imam Ahmad, the Khalifa, and Ahmad ibn Abi Du'ad. And, or, or Abdullah ibn Ishaq, actually. And then he says, Ya Ahmad, the Khalifa is telling Imam Ahmad, Ya Ahmad, do you know Salih al-Rashidi? He said, do you know Salih al-Rashidi? He said, he was my mu'addib. He's the one who taught me manners, etiquettes, poetry. He says, I mentioned the Quran and he disagreed with me. And I had him beaten. And he's telling him, someone dear to me and my mentor, I had him beaten. What do you think I'm going to do to you? He's threatening him. So Imam Ahmad uh, stayed quiet. Then he says, and you're not from those who used to come and frequent us and visit. He's trying to say now that you are of those who don't see that I'm the legitimate Khalifa. So Abdullah ibn Ishaq, he, he jumps in. He says, I've known him for 30 years. He sees obedience to the Khalifa. He's not like one of those rebels. He sees hajj and obedience to you. So then the Khalifa says, Wallahi innahu la faqih. Wallahi he's a faqih. Wallahi innahu la alim. Wallahi he's a scholar. And it would be pleasing to me to have him on my side, debating on my side. He says, give me any leeway, just give me anything, and I will free you with my own hands. And imagine the Khalifa saying this to you, just, just say something to me, and I will free you with my own hands, and I will walk behind him. He was telling Abdullah ibn will in front of Imam Ahmad, I will free him with my own hands, and I will walk behind him. And I will ride to him. Yani I will become his student. And I will ride. He won't come to me. I will ride to him. Very yani, enticing. The Khalifa is saying, I will let you go with my own free hands. He says, what do you say? He said, give me something from the book of Allah. Or the sunnah of his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa And I'll say it. So Khalifa just got up, sent me to prison. Then the next day, uh, yeah, actually, the same day, they sent him, Ahmad ibn Abi Du'ad, and other people. And he said these people sat down. One of them used to be from the students of a Shafi'i, but he switched to their side. 
under pressure and what have you. So they debated with me until Maghrib, and then they brought food, and they ate, and I didn't eat with them. He used to consider the, the wealth of the Khalifa haram. He didn't know where it came from, and he would take things by force. So he never ate the food of the Khalifa. He said, so they ate at Maghrib, and I was fasting, but I didn't eat that food. So I just pretended to be busy with other things until they took the food and they left. He spent the whole night without breaking his fast. So Ahmed ibn Abi Du'ad comes to him and he says, what do you say? The Khalifa says, what do you say? What's your response? He says, give me something from the book of Allah and the sunnah of his messenger so that I may say it. He says, the Khalifa, wallahi, he wrote your name with seven people to be executed. And I erased your name with my own hands. Yani it's going to, he said he is going to whip you until death. What do you say? He said, give me something from the book of Allah and the sunnah of his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa and I'll say it. The third day, Imam Ahmad said, I expected something's going to happen today. Day one, day two, he's, he's not going to be patient with me the whole time and just talk. So he said, I tightened my, like my uh, trousers like extra tight with an extra rope and everything. He said, I hated the idea of being uncovered in front of people. I walked in and the room was different this time. There were soldiers, weapons, with weapons, uniforms. And uh, this is the narration of this event. The eyewitness is a man by the name of Ahmad ibn al-Faraj. He was uh, working for the government. He said, I saw people clothe closing their stores and taking their weapons and running towards the palace of the Khalifa. So I said, what's going on today? He said, today, they're, they're going to bring Ahmed to the palace. This is the third day. And everyone's expecting something's going to happen. So the people brought their weapons in case they, I mean, they're going to go in, get into it with the soldiers of the Khalifa. A lot of tension in this city. So he said, I, had, uh, I knew someone who was one of the, the guards of the Khalifa. So I went to him and I said, look, man, can you get me in? I got to see this. So the guy tells him, would you like that? I said, yeah. So okay, he brought me fancy clothes like a nobleman, rich guy, big white belts that they used to wear, all these fancy clothes. Then he brought some people. He said, I want you to bear witness he's going in and it's his responsibility. He's going in at his own risk. He said, okay. He said, I went in first row. He got him like the best seats possible. He said, I was in the first row. I looked left to me was, was Ibn Zayyat, big shot. This guy, big guy in the government, a well-known figure as well, said Ibn Zayyad was sitting right next to me. And I'm like sitting there. He said, then I saw the chair of the Khalifa, was like a throne and had all kinds of things on it, gems and stuff on it. And then the Khalifa came and sat down. And he said, where is this one who says that Allah speaks with two instruments? Yani, tongue and lips. Imam Ahmad never said that. But that's what they do every time. He said, oh, you're saying he has ears like us? They always do that. He said, bring him to me. So Imam Ahmad came in saying, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. So the Khalifa starts from the beginning. He says, are you Ahmad ibn Hanbal? He says, yes. He says, uh, and then he begins to ask him about his position regarding the Quran. So he narrates to him a hadith. Imam Ahmad narrates a hadith where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking to Musa. So he tells him, you have lied about the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa So Imam Ahmad says, if that was a lie from me against the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa then what do you have to say about uh, when Allah says in the Quran, وَلَكِنْ حَقَّ الْقَوْلُ مِنِّي لَأَمْلَأَنَّ جَهَنَّمَ He's saying the verse, but the, the, يعني, the speech or the truth speech from me is that I will fill the hellfire with humans and jinn. He said, this qawl, who's making it? If Allah doesn't speak, who's the one who said the truth speech that he's going to fill the hellfire with humans and jinn? So he was quiet. So he said, so then Ahmad ibn Abi Du'ad yells out, kill him and his blood is on me. Yani is on my neck. Don't even worry about this, the sin of it. I'll take any sin. Kill him right now. And the Khalifa was hearing people left and right saying, yelling, kill him, he's a mubtadi, kill. So he lifted his hand and he struck Imam Ahmad in his face. Imam, and this guy is a soldier, right? And Imam Ahmad, old man and he's frail and he's weak and he's not been eating. And so Imam Ahmad fainted immediately. When he fainted, remember we said there were a lot of guards and soldiers. And the guards from Khurasan, specifically that area, 
who used to work with his grandfather, Hanbal, we said he's famous, they all took a step or two back. So they moved back to the ranks, like they don't approve. The Khalifa heard this commotion and movement, so people start to raise their voice inside, people start to raise, people outside with their weapons, we said they're surrounding the palace, heard the noises inside, they thought maybe they killed Imam Ahmad, they started yelling and screaming outside, so the Khalifa got scared. And he said, uh, get him some water. So they brought him some water. His, when Imam Ahmad woke, he found his uncle, his haq, uh, Ibn Hanbal, with the water. So he tells him a statement that means, this guy is not an intellectual, doesn't know how to go back and forth, but he starts hitting with his hands. <laughs> so the Khalifa was so mad. He said, wait, Hakum, do you see that this man is attacking me like that? They said, kill him, and his blood is on us. He said, I swore that I'm not going to kill him by the sword. So, and he cursed Imam Ahmad. And he said, يعني he's يعني, he cursed. And then he said, by my blood relation to the Prophet ﷺ, that I'm going to kill him with whips. He said, when he said that, everybody just lunged at me and they tore my clothing off of me. And then the Khalifa yells out, al wa siyat These are these like two poles they used to put up like this. Then they would tie your hands to them. And the siyat are the whips. I'm just going to tell you how the whipping was conducted and let's pray. He said, he brought the, the, the floggers, the whippers, the floggers, one by one. Okay. He said, bring me the whips. He examined them and said, these are not good enough. They took him back, they brought some more fierce whips. Look, he said each, each person would whip him two times only. So he's got a, a row of floggers, each one has a quality whip, and each one will give him two, full power, full strength, and then move to the back of the line. Because if each one gives him 50, and by the time you get to 12, خلاص, they start to be weaker, right? But they're going to be fresh. One, two, full power, next, one, two, next, like that. So they, he would tell him, Idrib qata Allahu yadak, afflict pain, may Allah cut off your hand. And he would go, one, two, next one, Idrib qata Allahu yadak, afflict pain, may Allah cut off your hand. And he would hit one, two, and move to the back. So then, uh, then the Imam collapsed on his, uh, his arms dislocated because he said the soldier was telling me to hold on to the poles I didn't understand what he was saying and my arms got dislocated when they stretched the rope so then he collapsed and the Khalifa is in front of him and they're telling him the Imam is standing in front of you and he's kept poking me with the sword and he's telling the Khalifa is telling him, you think you can defeat all these people I and mean, you're one man I've got soldiers here, I've got scholars, judges. You think you're going to defeat everybody in here? And, and people are yelling at him. It's Haq ibn Ibrahim. Hey, the Khalifa is standing. Answer him, respond to him. And others are saying, kill him, kill him. And then he brings the main guy. This guy is like a beast, this, this main flogger. And we're done. Well, this main guy, he says, hey, and how many can you kill him? The guy says, five. And yani five lashes, I'll kill him. He says five, or 10, or 15, maximum 20. And from five to 20, I'll kill him. So he tells him, kill him. And he starts to whip the Imam, and everyone in the room is amazed at his patience. How is remaining patient with that? So I'm gonna stop here. I don't know if this will continue another day. I couldn't, I thought I was gonna finish the whole thing, even though I have like four small pages left. But Maybe it's a good cliffhanger. We'll finish. <laughs> we'll finish another time, inshallah. Zakumullah khairan. Huh? Uh, it's up to you guys. After salah, some people want to leave. It's up to you. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad, Zakumullah khairan for listening attentively. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.